and welcome back meteorology students to another online video lecture. Today's video lecture will cover the different weather forecasting models that meteorologists use to make predictions and make their forecasts. So the weather forecasting models are numerical models. In other words, they're based on math. The mathematical models are of the atmosphere and are used to predict the weather. These models can be used to generate both short-term or long-term predictions. What the models do is they sample the state of the atmosphere. Now remember, the atmosphere is a fluid. In other words, air is always rising, air is always sinking, and air is rotating. And here's an image that best gives you a visualization of that. So if you look at this satellite image here, you can see several different parts around the globe where the air is rotating either clockwise or counterclockwise. And you can't really see the, the rising and sinking air here, but if you look at the clear areas, that's where the air is being pushed down. And if you look at the cloudy areas, that's where air is rising and cooling. So this, again, I like looking at this. It, it really um, puts into perspective when we talk about the atmosphere being a fluid. This gives you a visualization of just how fluid the atmosphere is. Now, the math equations that are used to predict the weather are based on different factors. Those factors include density, pressure, temperature, and the velocity and direction of the wind. And depending on what numbers are entered into the models, it could give us, or it does give us, different weather outputs or different weather predictions. So we talk about predicting the weather. There's, no, there's never a 100% certain forecast. And it's because of these different variables that change in the different models. Now, how do they gather this information? There's several different things they can do. And these are the methods right here listed in the bullets of gathering information to plug into the different numerical models. One way is to launch weather balloons. Weather balloons fly up into the, into the upper atmosphere and they take data um, consisting of temperature, temperature change in the different layers of the atmosphere, wind and wind direction or wind change in the different layers of the atmosphere, um, dew point. Um, how much energy is in different parts of the atmosphere. So weather balloons is one way of collecting data. Weather satellites, like the image I showed you earlier, is a way to collect data. Um, pilots give data back to the National Weather Service or, or back to different areas as they're flying. Um, commercial pilots might relay the message of traveling through turbulence, or other pilots might fly directly into the eye of a hurricane and that gives us information about those types of storms. Also, ships out in the oceans can send data back. Um, and then we always look at the sea ice and the sea surface temperatures. Um, you've probably heard of La Nina or El Nino. Those are based on the surface temperatures of the oceans and can dictate and control our weather in different parts of the year. Okay, so I'll, I've attached this in the Google Classroom, um, this PowerPoint, and you can actually go through and watch these YouTube videos from the PowerPoint. But this actually shows you what happens during a, a National Weather Service um, weather balloon launch. So it's a good thing to go back and watch these videos. I showed them in class also, but if you are absent or if you want a little re review or reinforcement, um, you can go back and watch these YouTube videos attached here. And here's one of um, some meteorologists in an airplane flying through the hurricane eye wall. Okay, so here's the different weather models that we'll discuss in class. And you'll actually become familiar with these and you'll use these to predict the weather. The first one is called the GFS or abbreviated as the GFS. And that stands for the Global Forecast System. Now with the GFS, a few things I want you to know from these weather models is how far out they can predict, um, when they run them, and what are the best models for predicting short-term and long-term. So starting with the GFS, the GFS can actually predict 16 days out into the future. They are not as um, accurate the further they go out. 
but they can give you an idea of some weather trends or if we can expect a, a cool down or a warm up um, two weeks away. Um, but they're not as accurate in predicting if it's going to rain two weeks from today or snow two weeks from today. Those change as they run the model run um, each time they run it. So they run the global forecast system four times per day, and they give you the times on this slide here. And again, like I said, the skill of the forecast decreases with time. Um, further out is good for climatology, gives you a, a percent chance or a probability of having below normal temperatures or above average precipitation. But if you were to pinpoint the time of day it rains two weeks from now, that would even be difficult um, with these weather models. And then the last update to this model was in June of 2019. I'm gonna flip around a little bit here because this is, we can give you a view of the GFS. And this is the GFS right here. So I'll click on, this just means it's not loaded all the way. I'll click on one that's already loaded. Um, go continental US and let's go precipitation type. So here is today, Wednesday morning. And you can see as we scroll through this model, it gives you the forecast or it gives you the precipitation type and sea level pressure for all the way out to this date right here. So that's actually 384 hours away. Okay, so that's a GFS. Can predict uh, up to 16 days out. More accurate though, um, closer to the time that you're looking at it. Hey, the next model is a European model. Or we, we abbreviate that as the Euro. The Euro model um, can again, predict or forecast 15 days out. The Euro model is great for seasonal forecast or um, the probability of a warmer than average summer, and that can predict up to 12 months out. And also we'll talk a little bit about ensemble forecasting. Ensemble is taking a lot of different runs of one model, but changing some variables very slightly. And then what it does is it gives you the probability based on many different runs of one model. It gives you the probability of a weather event occurring um, based on the average or the mean. So the Euro is good for those ensemble forecasting. And again, back to another weather site. If we look at the models here, and here is the European model that's actually just loading right now. So here's another weather site you guys will use. And this is the um, European model. So you can see um, different weather events happening and then make predictions. Like I usually tell the kids, if you're looking at the European model for um, tonight into tomorrow morning, what would you expect or what could you predict maybe for southern Michigan? And most kids or most people would say a chance of maybe some light rain. So that's how these models work here. Okay, again, embedded in this video is Dr. John Neese from Penn State University. Um, I showed this in class, but if you'd like to watch it again, this just explains how those ensemble forecasts work. Okay, another model is the NAM or the North American model. The North American model is better for short-term weather forecasting. The North American model runs four times a day and can forecast up to 84 hours out. The North American model also provides finer detail than the GFS. And I'll show you some images of what I mean by finer detail um, and also more accurate because it is a shorter range model. So if we go to the NAM, here's the NAM right here, and it was just recently updated, but you can see it doesn't go out as far as the GFS and the resolution is finer detail. So here's those storms coming through, not storms, here's that rain that the Euro showed coming through later tonight. So this is still picking up on maybe some light rain in Southern 
Lower Michigan tonight. And then the NAM nest is good for predicting or, or giving us short term for, for severe type weather. But again, on the near on the NAM nest here, even higher definition. And you can see tonight into tomorrow, it is again picking up and predicting some light rain showers in central lower Michigan or central southern Michigan. Okay, so here is again, I like showing this because this is the difference between the NAM and the GFS. And you can see if you just look at the areas, this was taken at the same time, but if you look at the areas of precipitation, the NAM is higher definition. Okay, so there's the GFS, looks a little more blurry. There's the NAM, GFS and the NAM. Okay, and then the other short range models that we talk about and use in class are the high res, the HRR, and the RAP or the rapid refresh. Okay, these are good for really short term forecasting. And the nice thing about the high res and the rapid and the rapid refresh is that they run every hour. So each hour, a new model, they run the model again. So a new prediction or a new forecast is spit out. Uh, they can forecast up to 18 hours. The data in the forecast, again, is updated each hour and provides a short range hourly weather forecast. So going back to this site, here's the high res. This just means it's not uploaded all the way. So we can go to the previous model run, which is, and you can see here, this is tonight, actually later this afternoon and tonight into tomorrow. But this actually has those same uh, area of, of light rain showers or sprinkles um, coming in a little bit earlier on the high res. And this changes each hour. So if you're checking the high res and you want a pretty accurate forecast, if you have something going on two or three hours from now, um, the high res is a good model to use. Okay, other weather models that we use um, is the Canadian model. I like to use the Canadian model for winter weather. So usually when we start getting snow here in West Michigan, I'll show the students or I'll show you the Canadian model. And then also the um, hurricane weather research and forecast model. So for the fall semester during the peak of the hurricane season, I will go to these um, hurricane models and can actually show the students some good data and some good forecasting on the hurricane. So Tropical Tidbits is a good site for um, the hurricane models. And here is Hurricane Sally, zoom in a little bit. So this is just on the GFS right here, but if I go to the models, you can actually click on the hurricanes, um, tropical storms and disturbances that exist in the um, ocean at this time. So here's a zoom in uh, close up of Hurricane Sally. You can see the pressure on this screen right here and uh, the amount of rainfall, how heavy it is, um, severity, etc. So, and then you can also do things such as checking the wind speed on these hurricanes. So, different links to click on from this hurricane site. And this is a good one. Again, during the peak season, usually in the fall semester when I'm teaching about the models. Okay, and then the last thing we wanna talk about here is actually um, determining the time for these models. Because if you look at the models, we'll go back to this one right here. Notice that the time is not 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 p.m. It's given to you in Z, which stands for Zulu time. So there's a method of converting from Zulu time to where we are in the Eastern time zone. Um, and usually that's all I have you guys convert is where we are here in the Eastern time zone. Um, if you're traveling somewhere else, you might wanna to convert to Central Mountain Pacific. But just for this class, you need to know how to convert this Zulu time into Eastern Daylight Time and Eastern Standard Time. 
So here's the here's the um, the way to do that right here. We refer to Zulu time as UTC or Coordinated Universal Time, and that is based on Greenwich Mean Time, which is at the prime current and prime meridian. Zero zero Z is 12 a.m., but it's 12 a.m. at the prime meridian, not here in Michigan. 13 Z, based on a 24-hour clock is 1 p.m., but again, it's 1 p.m. at the prime meridian. So to calculate for our time zone, Eastern Daylight Time, which is in effect until November, we've got to convert it to a 12-hour clock. And you can do that by subtracting 12 hours of, from anything over 13Z, or I'll tell you how I like to think about it. Once you convert to the 12-hour clock, you then have to subtract four hours from that to get to Eastern Daylight Time, which is where we are in Michigan. So let me give you some examples. Here's 14Z. And I like to say anything that's over 12Z, I like to say how much more than 12 is that? So 14Z, how much more than 12 is 14? And 14 is two more than 12. That means it's 2 p.m. if you convert that to the 12-hour clock but it's 2 p.m. at the prime meridian. So then what you've got to do is take that 2 p.m. and subtract 4 from it, and that gives you Eastern Daylight Time. So 2 minus 4 gives you the 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And to count that out, it would be 2 p.m. and then minus 4 would be 1, noon, 11 a.m., 10 a.m. Okay, one more example here, and you'll practice this in class too, or you already have if you're watching this video. But one more example is if you look at 6Z, you don't have to do the 12 hour conversion for this because this is already a 12 hour clock. 6Z is just 6 a.m., but that's 6 a.m. at the prime meridian. So we've got to convert that to the Eastern time zone. Six minus four hours would give us 2 a.m. Okay. And that is, there's one more video that goes through tropical tidbits and looking at weather models. We'll practice those in class, but that is your video lecture on uh, numerical we weather models.